Follow the money, they say. Well, are you? In this video, I'm going to talk about that very thing and where you need to have your cash, your capital, your investments. The very first thing I need to look at is the insatiable demand for energy. That's really key. Once we understand the demand and, of course, the supply, we're going to be able to realize where we need to have capital deployed. The second thing I need to look at is commodities in flux. Right now, as we stand in 2023, there's chaos. If you are going in blind, you can be sideswiped, you can be negatively affected by what's about to occur. Stick with me. I'm going to explain it right here for you today. You don't want to miss it. Let's begin. You've heard the saying, follow the money, but it's important in this case here to really, really know where the money is going to. And who's the biggest investor? Well, it's not just individuals. It's not just the Warren Buffetts of the world. We're talking about governments. Where governments deploy their capital, we must be aware of this and realize that they're going to be able to put in more than anybody else, any other company, either other corporation or billionaire. And at the same time, fundamentals may not matter. So if we keep that in mind, we're going to have much more sound investing principles. I don't hear anybody else talking about this, and yet it's so simple. Here's one example. Britain's renewable power hits new peak. Fossil fuel also rises. So the energy situation, uh, particularly in Europe, has been such a, you know, terrible over the last while. But I wanted to let me read this to you, but then I'm going to explain why. OK, renewable power sources generated 40 percent of Britain's electricity in 2022. Very expensive, by the way, up from 35 percent in 2021, while the share of fossil fuel in the energy mix also rose. Overall generation from renewables has more than quadrupled over the last decade. Wind, solar, biomass, and hydro are the main sources of renewable power. Now, this is what we need to understand. You could say, I don't like solar. I don't like wind. I don't like any of these things. But this is where, and by the way, let me add this in right now again, nuclear, uranium, these things here are where governments are deploying, if you look at it globally, trillions of dollars. There are corporations that will benefit from this. You don't have to like it. You don't have to be in favor of it. But what you have to do is make the right investment choices. I can't give you financial advice, but I can give you all the ammunition you need to make the right decisions. Does that make sense to you? Trillions of dollars going in one direction. If there's a recession, it doesn't matter. If Warren Buffett says he doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. Trillions are going in this direction. Do you get me? Here's one example that I wanted to show you. 25 years of lithium production. And I'll explain this to you here. I hope you can see it. Perhaps I'll zoom in. You could look at Australia. Australia produces more than 50% of the world's lithium. That's one fact. But check this out. And China accounts for over 90% of Australian lithium exports. Do you see what's happening here? These two partners are so important to each other for many things. Lithium is just the one that they're explaining here. And what does this go into? Well, batteries for one. This is really important because everything's got batteries. The cars have batteries, the cell phones, the laptops. Everything seems to have different lithium batteries in them. And so you could see how things have really, really escalated over the last few years. I mean, just taking it from, yeah, even four years ago, things have really started to increase. So that just gives you a little look graphically as to where, you know, where this has been. This is the mine production of lithium. And clearly, Australia head above heels uh, on the rest, but Chile, also China, and they move it on. Now, I think it's important to show you as well that China is the third largest producer and controls 60% of global battery grade lithium refining capacity. Because just like any other commodity, it's not so much as what you got in the ground, but how much of that are you able to refine? What do you do? Like rare earth minerals. This is the discussion all the time. Rare earth minerals, yeah, we've got them here. Vietnam has so many, US has so many, we've all got them. But who's actually bringing them up out of the ground and refining them? 
was China, like more than 90% of it. So that's the thing. It's not about, you know, well, Venezuela has a lot of oil, but if it's just sitting in the ground, it's not doing anybody any good. So that's my point here. Look at that as well. Where the money is going to, if it's not being deployed to pull that out of the ground in Venezuela, should you be invested in the Venezuelan oil? That's up to you. You can take a risk, right? That's my point, okay? The right strategy for oil companies in 2023. Oil companies are facing increasing resistance from environmentalist groups and governments, resistance that is making the future of oil and gas industry less certain. Like, uh, let me go back to the first point again. I hope those who have stayed and watched us that you realize how huge this is. This is massive. This should be a factor in your investing to some degree, or at least you're avoiding certain aspects. Because if I'm going to go into something here, I need to know that the fundamentals are behind me. These companies, maybe it's a shale company, they're saying, why am I going to do much more exploration? Why am I going to do more mining and all these other companies when I'm not getting the incentives? Why would I? And so that's the intention by the government. They're saying we don't want to incentivize something in this way and we want to incentivize this. And they kind of push the private corporations in one direction. That, that's kind of what they hope for anyway. Energy demand is expected to grow at less than 1% per year through 2050 with oil demand facing increasingly stiff competition from other energy sources. We see that right now, but look at what happened. 2020, then beyond into 2022, what occurred? We saw that coal made a comeback. Coal, they were saying that this is something that you're never going to be able, that's it, we're going to bankrupt coal, coal's gone, coal's done. But look what happened. Energy companies increased spending in 2023 as oil prices rebound. Oil and gas companies uh, are have raised their budgets for more spending in 2023. So we do see this. There is demand for it. But is it long term? Is that where you want to deploy all your capital? That's up to you. It did really well. There's no question. And there's no replacing. That's what we learned. The When, when coal had this rise, we learned you, you can't just get rid of that other thing. Because, yeah, you can have some energy, but how expensive is it going to be to actually produce that? And you look, I saw one example of when they were charging a Tesla, I think it was a Tesla vehicle or one of these other electric vehicles, and the reporter or whoever it was asked the individual who was speaking, they said, what's the power source of the, you know, what's actually charging that car right now? And she said, I think it's coal. So you're using the coal power to charge the electric vehicle. And you got to realize like, we're still heavily, heavily dependent on these other sources. So you're not just going to just, you know, just get out of that. But if we're looking long-term investing, we need to realize where our money is, where it's going to in the next while. Why billions of barrels of oil go untapped in Brazil. Again, the same situation as mentioned with Venezuela. It's not as if, you know, oh, they have lots of reserves. They had to be pushing that out. And the only thing I wanted to mention here was that, you know, you've got a contract dispute between Petrobras and the government. So this oil company, if they're not able to dig it out, they're not able to get to those reserves, basically does nothing for the revenue. Suddenly, if that agreement, I mean, by the way, it's been since 2013 where they haven't been able to come to terms. If they do, whoa, now we got a lot coming online. What does that do to the price? Well, if there's so much, it could be good for the company because they're able to generate more revenue, but now you got much more supply. And if that supply is there, what do you think that does to the price? Well, that's right. Depends on, of course, um, you know, how much there's always demand and supply fluctuations every day basically so i watch that but this is important okay so the contracts there if that gets this dispute gets uh, dealt with well then things change okay now really quickly we wanted to cover this the crash in u.s natural gas prices incentivizes power plants to ditch coal that's right so even within these industries, we see the balance in between the two. And I'm not so sure that, you know, companies wanted to go this way towards coal, having to go back into that time, having to deal with something that we're trying to, 
trying to get rid of ultimately there was no new mines opening all the mines are shutting down slowly so this is difficult to do business with but natural gas was so expensive super expensive especially in europe so then things changed well here we are today okay crude oil inventories fall again even as the spr inventory draws continue this has been going on the strategic petroleum reserve just continues to decline and that's important i would say it's important but uh admittedly the timing seemed seemed to be okay on that but anyway here we have it just showing you that chart i just wanted to break down the fact that in times where we see trillions of dollars going somewhere we should be paying attention that's all that's my message for this supply and demand is a fundamental principle of economics that describes the relationship between the quantity of a product or service that is available and the quantity that is desired by consumers the law of supply and demand states that in a competitive market the price of a product or service will adjust to reach a balance between the quantity supplied by producers and the quantity demanded by consumers in the case of a commodity such as oil the price is determined by the interaction between the supply of oil and the demand for it if the demand for oil is high and the supply is limited the price of oil will increase conversely if the supply of oil is high and the demand is low the price will decrease the price of oil can also be affected by external factors such as political instability in oil producing countries natural disasters and technological advancements that can either increase or decrease the cost of extracting and transporting oil the price of oil can have a ripple effect on the prices of other goods and services as oil is a key input in the production of many products for example if the price of oil increases it may lead to a higher transportation costs which can then lead to higher prices for consumer goods similarly a decrease in the price of oil may lead to lower production costs and lower prices for consumer goods so this is the back and forth this is the explanation that i wanted to show you but it's all real simple when we look at it from that thirty thousand foot or zooming out as i like to describe it i hope this video was informative to you i'm just trying to highlight what we've seen so far where the money is going follow the money they say do you want to know more about follow the money do you want to know more of these tidbits that generally aren't shared out there all you gotta do is hit subscribe subscribe because every single day i bring you a video with really good information like this hit subscribe and i'll see you tomorrow take care